This morning, I want to talk about prayer. Prayer is one of the fundamental things that makes up a Christian's faith. And throughout, <clears throat> throughout Scripture, we see examples of God's people praying. We see many, many examples. And many of these have come up over the past couple of years in our textual study through of the Bible. But this morning, I wanted to have an opportunity to take a deeper look at some of these prayers <clears throat> so we can strengthen our faith and that we can learn a few things about how we might implement these elements of prayer into our own lives and model our prayers after some of the examples that we see in Scripture. <clears throat> so as a fitting way to start, I wanted to talk about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it just so happens that in our Bible class hour this morning, we had mentioned the Lord's Prayer a couple times, and the Lord's Prayer in its simplicity will give us an opportunity to look at some of the elements that make up prayer throughout Scripture. There's going to be four elements of prayer that we look at throughout this morning, and those are going to be easy to remember because they make up the, um, the mnemonic device P-R-A-Y, pray. So it's going to be easy to remember. But those four elements of prayer that we're going to look at this morning as we see these examples of prayer in Scripture are going to be praise, repentance, ask, and yield. Now, each one of those, I would say, is represented in the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and you see it on the screen in front of you, beginning in verse 9. The Lord says this prayer, In this manner therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Within this prayer, we see all four elements of prayer. And throughout all scripture, we see these elements time after time after time as they make up the prayers of the Bible. The first we see is praise. And we see here where, where Jesus begins the prayer, Our Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. We see this introduction in, in praise to God. Then as we look further down, we see this element of repent or repentance, where Jesus says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Certainly is an element of prayer that, that should be in our prayers as needed, is repentance. But then also, as, as Ricky alluded to this morning, there's supplication or simply asking God for things that your heart desires or asking God for things that you know are the brethren around us need or desire. But asking God, he points out here, give us this day our daily bread. We should be praying for the things that God blesses, with, blesses us with on a day-to-day -day basis. And also here, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Our asking of God can also be of a spiritual nature. You see, our daily bread is of a physical nature, but then leading us not into temptation is, is of a spiritual nature, in that we can ask God for strength spiritually, and as well as our physical blessings. And then lastly is, is this idea of yielding. And this may sound a little bit different as far as we normally talk about the elements of prayer, but this is one that I, I do find time and time again. And this is the idea that it's surrendering your own will to God's will. And we see this element in this prayer as well. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is something that, that is a critical part to prayer. Is It's not about our own desires. Um, it, it can be when we ask, but, but still it's, it's putting others, yielding is putting someone else's need above our own. And in this case, when, when it's in prayer and we're communicating with the Lord, it is putting God's needs above ours. It's putting God's will before ours. We also see that at the end of this prayer, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
It's about putting God's kingdom first. And so this is that, that last that makes up the four elements of prayer we're going to look at this morning. Praise, repent, ask, and yield. So the way our, our lesson and our study is going to be structured this morning is we're going to break those down and find two good Bible examples of prayer for each. So the first is going to be praise. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. With each of these, what I figured we would, would do to get an idea, especially with these first couple of praise, um, you know, we, we do actually, in our public prayers, a lot of times we will sprinkle in praise to God. And sometimes maybe even in our private prayers, we may have a practice of, of giving our praise to God. But I do feel that this oftentimes is one element of prayer that, um, that can be overlooked, is praising God and, and giving Him thanksgiving for the blessings that we have. So giving us an opportunity to read a couple of these prayers in their entirety, I think will give us a good idea of what we mean by a prayer of praise. The first one is 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And to set the context before we, we read this prayer here, this is toward the end of David's time as king of Israel. He's getting ready to, he's addressing all of the assembly, all the nation of Israel before him. And he's addressing them just in preparation for his departure from the earth and for his son to take his place as king. So that is the stage that's set for this. Beginning in verse 10, let's read his prayer. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty, for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you as were all our fathers our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now with joy, I have seen your people." who are present here to offer willingly to you. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart toward you. And give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provision. So there we have our first example of a prayer of praise. Now, all the prayers that we'll see will naturally not just be focused solely on one and only one of these elements of prayer. This, this prayer, as we near the end, starts sprinkling in prayers of supplication as well. Um, so we will see that for sure throughout our study this morning, is that they're not necessarily exclusive to one of these types of prayer. However, this prayer is predominantly a prayer of praise. We see early on uh, in this prayer that David is acknowledging that the Lord is head over all. And that is including himself. As king, he is a, in a position of authority and a position of power. But yet David is acknowledging that the Lord is head over all. You know, we can, we can, take, um, we can take note from this prayer as well in that in our prayers, we should acknowledge that all of our blessings are from God. You see, we see in, in verse 12, he points out riches and honor come from the Lord. And the end of the verse, he points out that even his very strength comes from the Lord. And then to take that step a step farther, 
everything that he discusses and says, anything that we give back to you, God, it first came from you. You first blessed us with the things that we can then in turn bless back to you and give back to you, Lord. And that is that all the blessings come from God. And then also as he concludes the prayer with supplication for the, the children of Israel, that they remain faithful and that they remain strong. And then also he, he prays for his own son, Solomon, and that Solomon may remain faithful. Those are also... Uh, elements of our prayers that we can sprinkle in. I want to make the, the point before we jump too farther in, too much farther into the study this morning. Prayer, it, there's no one absolute right way to pray. So as we go through this study, um, consider all these examples that we're going to talk about and understand that any one of them may be able to be something that you may apply in your own personal prayer and in a way for you to personally grow. But not every single one of them is something that you have to, to relate to or adapt into your own life. Because prayer is one of these things that there's not one right way to pray. Now, it is right that we are praying and that we should pray. That is a right thing for us to do. But the actual method and what we're saying in our prayer is, is not necessarily something that, that comes to you this morning as you must include all of these in your prayer, but simply our suggestions of how to enhance your own personal prayer life. So another one of the prayers of praise I want to talk about this morning is Jeremiah, and that's in Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah 32, beginning in verse 16. And this prayer really continues down into verse 25. We're going to stop at verse 22. Now Jeremiah says, Now when I had delivered the purchase deed to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. You are great in counsel and mighty in work. For your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You have set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt to this day and in Israel and among other men, and you have made yourself a name as it is this day. You have brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, and with great terror. You have given them this land of which you swore to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And we'll conclude reading there. To point out a few points from, from this prayer, he says in verse 17, Lord, there is nothing too hard for you. What an amazing sentiment to pray to God. Lord, I understand that there is nothing beyond your power. There's nothing beyond what you are capable of. There's nothing too hard for you. He also acknowledges God's greatness. He says, great God, or great in counsel, you are mighty in work. Verse 19. And then he continues on and, and points out some things that God already knows, the works that he's done. But he says, you have brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders. God knows of the signs and wonders that he's done. But yet we can praise God for the things that he knows that he's done in our lives. He knows the work that he's done in each and every one of our lives. But we can still acknowledge those back to God in our prayer and be thankful for those things that he does and be praiseful for those things that he's done for us. And we should praise God for his just and his wise characteristics. Um, we, see, we see there in this prayer um, in verse, uh, verse 21, you have brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with a strong, arm, strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. Um, and as, as he continues on, he points out and understands that, that God is just and, and God is wise and um, we certainly, too, can, can pray just like Jeremiah did. So hopefully both of these have given us an idea of how we can 
can include more praise in our prayers to God. The next element of prayer that I want to discuss this morning is repent and the need for repentance when it's necessary in our lives. The first and and perhaps most classic example of a prayer of repentance is David. And once again, we've seen David praying a prayer of praise, and now we're going to see David praying a prayer of repentance. And this is Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Now, many of us know the the story of David and, and his sin, um, that began with lust of the eyes and, and progressed and, and became a, a sin that was much, much more involved, was outward, and, and the sin with Bathsheba, and that was taken even to the point of, um, of sending a man away to, to even be killed in battle. And we, we know the story of David and, and the sin that he was involved in, and, and this is telling us here, this is the, sin, the, the prayer of repentance that followed the the atrocious actions of David. David begins here in verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make known, make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. For you do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. This prayer is so full of so many different elements of repentance. And I think this prayer alone could warrant a a full sermon by itself, but we won't be taking the full time to to do just that. But, But let's look at a few of the things that we do see. One of them is the desperate need for God's mercy. He begins saying, have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. We are desperately in need of God's mercy. And he goes on to continue to, to, to begin acknowledging his sin. And, and the first thing that he does is he acknowledges that he's in sin. This is the very first part of repentance is the admittance of sin and the admittance of guilt. And so this is something to keep in mind if, if we need to pray a prayer of repentance that we first need to begin with admission of guilt and admission of sin. He also notes that the consequences of sin, verse 3, he says, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. The consequences of sin are lasting. The consequences of sin don't necessarily just go away. They are things that may last. There there may be long-lasting repercussions following sin. Even though he requests that his sins are blotted out and that God forgets his sins, he he makes those requests as part of this, this prayer of repentance, that doesn't mean that the consequences will also go away with his guilt. His sin, also he acknowledges, is against God himself. Now, as I mentioned before, the the context of this prayer is that he sinned against man. 
he was guilty of murder for a man. And that sin was certainly against him. But yet he says here in verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned. He acknowledges that a sin that is against a fellow man is also against God himself. And that's something that we too need to realize is if we do something that, that hurts our brother or sister, if we do something that hurts a friend, if we do something that hurts one around us, that it is also a sin against God. He acknowledges that man himself, that the nature of man is that it is sinful. Verse 5 says, Behold, behold I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Man is sinful, and he points that out here. Um, there's a few other things, but I, you know, just for sake of time, I want to point out, God will blot out our sin. As I mentioned a second ago, he, David makes this request for God to blot out the sin. It's as if the sin is written down in a book and the ink is taken to blot out that sin so that the words describing what that sin was are no longer legible. They are put out of the mind of God. It's not as if they never happened because those consequences may last. But the words that are the sin have been blotted out. And God has that ability to blot out sins and to remember our iniquities no more, just as David requests here. The last thing, though, that I want to point out from, from this, this prayer of repentance that I think is particularly of note is, <clears throat> is David shows a desire at the end or toward the middle and the end of this prayer to still be near to God. Verse 11 he says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David knows that he's been estranged from God <clears throat> because of his sin. He's been separate from God. And part of our prayers of repentance when we are separate from God and we are desiring to come back to him is that we should desire to come near to God again. That is the other aspect of prayer of repentance is that we need to be forgiven of our sins, but yet we need to restore that relationship with God. And we need to desire that full restoration, that we may be near to him once again, because that is the nature of repentance. Another prayer of repentance I want to spend a little bit of time on is Ezra chapter 9. We've recently covered this in our Bible classes, but Ezra chapter 9 gives us another good example of prayer um, in the nature of praying for repentance. Now, this one is, is very different from the former in that the context is very different for this prayer. And that is that Ezra has just led a group of Israelites back from captivity, the second group of Israelites back from captivity. And when he gets back to Israel, he sees that the people of Israel have been in sin, that they have gone against the very commandments of God in that they have taken pagan wives. They've taken foreign wives as God has commanded them not to. And the reason this is so different from the prayer of David uh, is because Ezra himself had not committed the sin. And so as we prepare to read this prayer, keep in mind that this sin was not committed directly by Ezra but yet was committed by the children of Israel. And Ezra is praying on their behalf. So beginning in verse 5. <clears throat> Actually, beginning in verse 6. He says, O oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we... Our kings and our priests have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place, that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves... Yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our Lord, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. 
And now, O oh, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land, with the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their impurity. Now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such a deliverance as this. Should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there would be no remnant or survivor? O oh Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant as it is this day. Here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. What a powerful prayer we see here from Ezra as he is astonished at the sin that is around him. But he's not just astonished at the sin that's around him. He is taking ownership of that sin. As he uses the pronoun so many times, we, our, us, it's, he is acknowledging that he is part of the sin. He recognizes even the sin of the forefathers before him, First of all, in verse 5, we see, we didn't read verse 5, but he falls on his knees and his, his arms are outstretched to the Lord. He's showing this posture of humility to God as this, this prayer of repentance. This is something that when, when we have sinned, we can show God our posture of humility as well. If that's something that, that you feel so inclined to do, to show God a posture of complete surrender and complete humility to God because of the sin that we've had in our lives. He also, he too, begins with acknowledgement of sin and guilt. And even more specific than, than David did. David did not acknowledge specifically, um, you know, verbatim in his prayer what sin had he had committed. But here, Ezra acknowledges the specifics of the sin. And, and once again... The first part of repentance is admission of guilt and admission of sin. And then another point that we can make here is, as leaders, um, anyone that's in a leadership role or an authority role, now this can be a, a, a husband that's the head of the household, this could be an elder or a deacon or um, a boss at work or someone that is... Um, even just a good example to another, or a mother as they're an example to their children. Anyone that's in a position of leadership can understand that if those that look up to you or follow you are in sin, that you also too can take on the guilt, just as Ezra did. And that's important for us to acknowledge in our prayers, is to own up to the sin that, even if it's something that wasn't a commission of our own, Maybe perhaps it was an omission, something that we did not do for those that look up to us. Sins that, that we may not be held accountable for directly, but we still can make ourselves accountable for those in our prayer of repentance. But once again, um, prayers don't have to be limited to just one particular main theme. Ezra finishes the prayer here with, a praise for God's long suffering, almost as if he's he's uh, in awe of the fact that God had not utterly wiped out the children of Israel already. He's in awe and he's surprised that God had been so patient and so long suffering. And because of his gratefulness to God, he is offering up thanks and praise to God in concordance with his prayer of repentance and thankfulness to God for his patience and his long suffering. So this now takes us to our next element of prayer, and that is a prayers of supplication or asking God. The first one I want to look at here is, is Hannah. This is a, a, a fantastic and a great example of prayer that we see where someone is truly pouring their heart out to God 
and making requests to God. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel 1, starting in verse 10. Here we see it's described that she was in bitterness of soul. And it says she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Let's read verses 12 and 13 as well to get more context here of this prayer. And it happened as she was continuing praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. So we see here this prayer that Hannah is just utterly pouring out her heart to God. And she asks God for something so specific She asks God for the innermost desire of her heart, and that is that she wanted a child. And not just a child, but she asks specifically God, give me a male child. Give your maidservant a male child. It's okay to be asking God for things that we want. It's okay to go to God with our innermost desires. The thing is, God knows the hearts of man before we even come to him and ask for what we want. He knows what our desires are. And for Hannah, it's a great example that we can look to Hannah and pour out our hearts to God and ask God for what we want. Because God does hear our prayers. When we're earnestly praying to him, he will hear our prayers if we're in that right relationship with him and we're pouring out our heart to God. He will hear our prayers. Hannah is just a great example of a prayer from the heart. Especially we see that in verse 13. It says she spoke in her heart. Only her lips were moving. Eli couldn't even hear the words that she was speaking, but he could see her lips moving. And it says even in verse 12, she prayed. She continued praying before the Lord. My understanding of of that is this wasn't just a... Uh, you know, sitting down for one minute and, and giving God a, a request and saying, God, this is what I desire, and, and amen. This wasn't just limited to that. It was a continuation of her prayer. She was utterly pouring out her heart and her soul. And God's answer, he gave her a child. He answered her prayer with a resounding yes. And he blessed her with a child. What an amazing example of asking and, and God blessing in return. And then Hannah, we won't take time to look at this, but the whole next chapter, uh, really the, the first section of the next chapter in, in chapter 2, is Hannah's response then is uttering a prayer of thanksgiving and a prayer of praise. If you have an opportunity to read that, that is once again another fantastic example of a prayer of praise. But what an amazing example that Hannah is to us to simply pour out our heart to God when there's something that he wants. He will hear our prayers and he he may answer our prayers with a yes. Now, one thing that that Hannah does in her prayer of pouring out her heart to God is she makes a vow to the Lord as well and vows that if God blesses her in return as she's asking, that she would give that son back to God in service. Um, that's something that we see from time to time in prayers as well, is that some folks, uh, some, some of the characters of the Bible, when they pray to God, will utter out a vow as well. God, if you do this for me in return, I will do this for you. And certainly that's something that, that if we feel inclined to do so in our prayers, we may do that to God as well. The next prayer of asking that I wanted to to talk about, we won't read this prayer in full. It's a a long prayer, but it is Solomon. And this is at the conclusion of Solomon having finished the temple, finished construction on the temple. The temple is erected, and he is standing before all of the nation of Israel. Once again, um, we saw David, his father, praying in, in front of all the assembly of Israel. And now we see Solomon taking after that example and praying. Praying a prayer of praise. And um, there's praise elements in it when it starts. And then a prayer of supplication in front of all the assembly of Israel. 
In this prayer, we see so many things that, that Solomon is asking for. But there's really, uh, he begins with praise. And then there's really two main thoughts that Solomon is praying for in this prayer. And the first one is, is a specific prayer of supplication on his own behalf. And that is that he asks for God to keep his promise that he had made to David and that he had made to Solomon. Solomon is asking for the continuation of his family lineage to sit on the throne. And he asks for this in specifics. Um, now, another thing that, that I want to point out, another way that um, actually that Solomon sprinkles praise into this prayer, I think is, is worth mentioning. And that is verse 27. I have to get turned there myself. 1 Kings chapter 8 and in verse 27. He points out two of the characteristics of God that I think are just absolutely worth mentioning here as an element of praise in this prayer. But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. It's a prayer that's saying that he acknowledges that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. God cannot be contained. And even though part of this prayer is going to be a, a request for God to be in the temple, um, he acknowledges that God is everywhere and that he cannot be contained. And then in, in the same verse, we also see a, a hint at, um, at God's, the acknowledgement of God's omnipotence, that God, there is nothing that he is not able to do. And this is another element of praise that, that he sprinkles in here. But then also in verse 37, um, verse 37 of this chapter, I'm sorry, verse 39 of this chapter, um, he points out in parentheses, just a, a side thought and a side comment, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. So here in this prayer, he acknowledges really some of the key characteristics of God, that he is omnipotent or all-powerful, that he is omniscient or all-knowing, and that he is omnipresent or everywhere simultaneously and all at the same time. I just wanted to point that out because that's another element of praise that we can, can truly adopt into our prayers is pointing out those characteristics of God. But then the other main thing that is a, is a prayer of supplication is that he is asking on behalf of all the people of Israel, that God will always hear their prayers. He's asking that there's so many things throughout here, it's really throughout the entirety of this prayer, that he's saying, God, hear their prayers. When they have desires, hear their prayers. When they repent to you, hear their prayers. When they've been cast off into captivity and they're scared, hear their prayers. When they have um, prayers of praise, hear their prayers. When they pray toward the temple, hear their prayers. If visitors are, are not even, um, if, if those that are not even of the household of Israel are praying in the temple, hear their prayers. It's, it's really a petition to God to always hear the prayers of God's people. And God's answer is pretty different than the answer that he gave to Hannah. And that is that he comes back to Solomon in the next chapter and he gives him a conditional promise as he had always made the promise about carrying on his lineage and the throne shall be not departing from the house of, of David in a physical sense was always with a condition. And that condition was, if you serve me, if you always remember me, I will continue to let your family sit on the throne. And so the, the answer was quite different for Hannah and for Solomon. But his answer was, for the other part of the prayer, I will hear the prayers of the people. Okay, and the last of the four elements of praying that we're going to look at tonight, at this morning is that of yielding. Once again, this is where we are putting God's needs and God's desires and his will above our own. This one I want to only look at quickly. Um, it almost fits just as well in the prayers of supplication. But for the context of this prayer in, of, of Hezekiah in 2 Kings, he's praying for deliverance. Many of the nations around Judah at the time, Judah the southern kingdom, many of the nations had been oppressed by Assyria and had fallen to Assyria fallen captivity and been defeated by Assyria, which Assyria was the powerful nation at the time. And 
Hezekiah was offering up a prayer to God for deliverance. But the reason I put this in the section of yielding instead of asking is because of the motivation of this prayer. 2 Kings, let's read 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings 19, verses 15 to 19. So as we finish, as we get toward the end of this prayer, pay particular attention to what Hezekiah's apparent motivation is for offering up this prayer of deliverance. He said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. And here, now in verse 19, we'll see his motivation. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. His motivation for offering up this prayer is for the Lord's reputation. He wants the Lord to have a good name. He wants the people around in other nations to, to know that the Lord, he is the one and the only true God. And that is his motivation for offering up this prayer. It's not of a selfish nature. And this is why I, or it's not of an asking on his own behalf. And that's why I, I choose to put it more in the section of yield rather than ask. And that is because he is surrendering his own desires, although it's aligning in this case, but his own desires are for God to be able to uphold his own reputation. God's answer to this is he says, I will defend this city for my own sake. That is the answer that he has. And, and this is, I think, just a good example of praying on God's behalf, praying for things so that God is praised and that God is glorified and that God's reputation is upheld. And then perhaps there's, there's no better example of prayer than Jesus. And there, there are so many other prayers that, uh, that I could have chosen for giving us an example of Jesus' prayer. But the one that stands out to me is the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Turn with me there in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to read verses 36 to 44. We won't read this, this whole section, but what I do want to read is verse 39 in particular. He, it says, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This is the quintessential example of praying and yielding to God and giving up your own will so that you can carry out the will of God. This is the absolute number one best example of yielding in, in all of Scripture. And that is that God, Jesus himself, manifest in the flesh, the Lord himself in the flesh, praying to God, please, God, let this cup pass from me. This cup being the suffering that he was about to endure, going to even to the point of crucifixion and death on the cross. Lord, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And in this section of Scripture, we see that Jesus not only prayed this same prayer once, but he prayed it another time. The same words. And then he prayed it again. He prayed this prayer not once, but three times. He prayed this same prayer to the Lord. We too can take from this example. And when we pray, we need to surrender our will to God's. We must follow God's plan in our lives. And, and God's plan, we may not fully always understand what his plan may be for us, but that's all the more reason for us to go to God in prayer and say, God, not my will, but yours be done. What a great example. Another thing that we can take from this is that Jesus did not utter a long prayer here. This prayer is very succinct. It is straight and it is to the point. 
And our prayers can be likewise. They can be straight and to the point. And when we know in our heart of hearts and we know what we long to say to God, we don't have to change our prayer. We can repeat our same prayer time and time and time again, three times, 20 times, 100 times. If we repeat our prayer, it only is there for emphasis. And that is okay too for us to repeat our prayers just as Jesus did himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. So this has been a study looking at four elements of prayer. My question to you and my, my challenge to you is to reflect on your own personal prayer life. Hopefully this has been edifying. Something, something maybe that I've said is something that you might be able to take and apply to your own prayer life. I know certainly going through and, and studying for this myself um, and having this thought of, of what I wanted to talk about for, for quite a while now, this has been something that's been in, at the forefront of my mind and in my prayer life is how can I apply some of these things to my own prayer life? But it is these elements of prayer, praising God, repenting when necessary, asking God for the innermost desires of our heart if need be, or for the desires of those around us, and then yielding and surrendering our own will to God's will. So all types of these prayers are important for our spiritual growth, but perhaps the most important example that we've looked at this morning is that example of the Lord and his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, in which he demonstrates putting the will of the Father above his own. My question for you now is, have you done that? Have you surrendered your will to God's will? Have you done so by putting on Christ in baptism? If you've never done that, this is, this morning, an opportunity for you to do so. This is my invitation to you to do so, to surrender, to yield, and to put your own will aside and to put God's will above your own and to enter into a relationship with him as it's done through baptism, putting off the old man that's corrupted with sin and being raised out of that water to be a new man, incorruptible, and that we can serve God with, with newness and freshness of, of, of renewal of our spirit and that we may truly desire to be near to him. If this is, is something that sounds appealing to you to put on Christ in baptism, I would encourage you this morning to make that happen. If you need prayers of repentance, this may also be an opportunity for you to come to the front and to request those prayers of repentance on your behalf. If there's any spiritual need that you have this morning, I would encourage you to come to the front now as we stand and as we sing.